So good afternoon. Again, I welcome you to today's forum. My name is Kimberly Holiday, and I will be serving as your moderator. This is the Together We Will Heal series organized by Central Texas African American Family Support Conference. The conference's vision is to educate the African American community on mental health, substance use disorder, and intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as the total well being of African Americans. Through this series, we hope to continue the courageous conversations around these topics and the public health challenges posed to us by the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's forum is brought to you by Integral Care and sponsored in part by AISD. We appreciate Austin Independent School District for providing the Spanish interpreters and live streaming of today's forum on their AISD TV. Before we get started, um, there's a few housekeeping things I would like to go over. First of all, remember we are virtual and live on Facebook as well as AISD TV. So we ask that you please all mute Hello. your microphones to eliminate any background noise at this time. And I actually do hear some background noise. So I'm gonna ask that you all will please mute. Thank you so very much. There will be time for interactions. Uh, you may raise your hand and then unmute yourself to talk when called upon. We have several hosts uh, who are on the screen with us today. And we also ask that you use the chat box for your questions and your feedback during today's presentation. If you get emotional, or overwhelmed, please simply mute yourself and feel free to turn off your camera to handle yourself appropriately. And please know that your emotions are okay. Note that the session is being recorded, so put on your happy face. Um, and at the end of the forum, we will have some conference shop items to raffle off to our attendees. To be eligible, you must be present to win. So I encourage each of you to stay all the way until the end. And again, I thank you for being here today. All right, let's jump right in. Today's topic is the impact of suicide on African Americans in Texas. Woo, I could just sit right there for a moment. That's heavy. Our guest, Waikisha McKinney, is the Zero Suicide Program Manager for the Harris Center for Mental Health and Intellectual Dis uh, Disabilities in Houston, Texas, on the board chair of the Southeast Texas chapter of the A American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. She has been featured in several documentaries, television interviews, books, and other publications. Waikisha's fight against suicide began with the loss of her brother, Johnny Madison, who died by suicide in 2004. Overwhelmed by grief after the death of her brother, Waikisha slipped into a major depression, which almost ended her own life in a suicide attempt. With the support of her family and the help of local counseling centers, she was able to get the help she needed to cope with her loss and manage her depression. She also found hope and recovery in serving others that has been affected by suicide. Over the last 14 years, Waikisha has obtained a wealth of knowledge and experience in crisis intervention and suicide prevention, of which she is more than eager to share with us today. So I would like to present to some and introduce to, uh, to others, Waikisha McKinney. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and such and for such a, um, your, your voice is just amazing. So even listening to my own introduction, I was like, wow, she sounds amazing. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Um, thank you all so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be able to share some information with you. Um, I'm going to share my screen in just a little bit, um, and, and you've heard my background. Uh, so I just want to reiterate what has already been said, which is thank you for being here and your willingness to learn and share. Um, so let me go ahead and share my PowerPoint with you all. 
Okay. So we are going to talk today about the impact of suicide on the African on African Americans in Texas. And what I have uh, put together here is just a brief overview of some recent um, statistics and basic information on suicide. I do welcome questions and dialogue. And so I know there will be a little bit of time for that um, in the, at, at the close of the presentation. Uh, however, if there's a pressing question, please go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll, we can take a look at it and, and go from there. So um, as mentioned, I am a survivor of suicide loss. Uh, my brother died by suicide in 2004, uh, and I have been doing this work uh, in suicide prevention and sharing information in suicide prevention ever since. I'm even more eager and excited to be able to share this uh, information with African American communities, um, particularly because I feel like there is still such a stigma around suicide and around mental illness and mental health care um, in the African American community. And we are seeing some changes in the numbers uh, with regards to suicide that definitely need attention and they need some work. And so whenever I have an opportunity to talk with, um, to talk with groups who work with African Americans or who are African American, I'm even more excited because those are the opportunities that we can use to break down the stigma and really teach and educate folks on, um, on where we are. So here's what we know about suicide. Um, we know that suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, claiming more than 48,000 lives a year. Um, it is the second leading cause of death for our children and teens as young as 10 years old. Um, and some of our, our older adults as well, going up as, as old as 34 year, years old. For one suicide death that occurs, there are 25 attempts, approximately. So that's about 1.4 million suicide attempts per year. And um, we hear, we talk a lot about suicide deaths um, and, and things that we can learn from them, but we also need to be able to, to, to pay more attention to those who have survived suicide attempts and what we can learn from them as well. And as you can see, the impact is much larger than the one person who dies by suicide. It is, there are individuals who are affected, who attempt suicide and survive that 1.4 million. And then there are folks like me, survivors of suicide loss. So um, recent studies have shown that about 135 people are affected by one suicide death. So that's roughly about 5.4 million people per year. And we're just talking about loved ones. We're talking about family members. We're talking about coworkers, friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives. Over the years, um, I have seen and met so many different people that have been affected by the loss of a loved one to suicide. I could tell stories about veterans who lost their buddies. You know, and I could tell stories about our first responders who lost their partners or who lost their um, their colleagues who used to fight fires with them or go and fight crime and yet they lost their battle with mental illness. Um, I could tell stories about sisters who are who are saying goodbye to their siblings or brothers and parents and just, you know, so many different people, even doctors and, and physicians and mental health care uh, professionals who've lost patients and clients. Um, there is, you know, the thing, the thing that's important to know with this is that suicide is not, um, it does not discriminate against who it affects or who it impacts. Um, there are even studies and research that are showing now that, um, that most Americans will experience or have, have been affected in their lifetime by a suicide loss. And so, the, so we know that there is work to be done and that this is a major problem for our country. So the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention provides these facts and figures every year by state and also nationally. So in Texas, uh, and this data is from the CDC fatal injury uh, report from 2018. Um, and so in Texas, one person dies by suicide every two hours in our state. Okay, it is the 11th leading cause of death overall for us. Um, and, and, and similarly to the national numbers, the second leading cause of death for those ages 10 to, four, 10 to 34. Um, and then almost three times as many people die by suicide in Texas in 2018 than in alcohol related motor vehicle accidents. And so, and yet we still 
are not having very open conversations or we still haven't gotten to the place where we can openly discuss and talk about suicide as openly as we would talk about drunk driving, as openly as we would talk about cancer or smoking cigarettes, um, or as open as we would even talk about the opioid crisis. There's some data that shows that more lives are claimed by suicide than the opioid crisis. And yet we are still fighting this battle to make suicide a priority of discussion. Um, and, and, and then also one of the stats that I find interesting or one of the pieces of information on this document that I find interesting is that is the cost of suicide. So suicide cost Texas a total of $3,516,245,000 combined lifetime. So it's combined lifetime medical and work loss costs. Okay, so that's an average of about a million dollars per suicide death. And we don't often think about the, imp the financial impact of a suicide death. Usually when we're thinking about the impact, we're looking at, um, the one person who died and what their loss may have, how their loss may have impacted one or two people in a sense. But there is a, a financial cost um, and even a larger community impact connected to a suicide death. What we also need to know is that there have been increases in suicide over the past several years. Um, in 2018, the Center for Disease Control released a report that showed that suicide rates rose across the country from 1999 to 2016, about 20 to 25%. Um, and many states saw a 30% increase in suicide, including Texas. And so we're, we're already seeing the increase in the jump in the suicide rates overall. Okay, and then we also know, um, but what we're also seeing is the changing face of suicide and the increase in the rates amongst African-American and Latino, Latinx um, individuals. And so this next part talks about or shows kind of some data. I'm sorry, my, my coworker just kind of bumped me. So I guess I disturbed her nap. Um, but it, we talk about the changing faces of suicide. And, and I put this here because historically, Research and data has have shown us that, or research and data shows that the face of suicide is, is the older middle-aged white male. However, recent, recent reports from the Center for Disease Control um, and, and several other of our, our agencies have shown that the face of suicide is changing. And so that means that our work may also need to change a little bit. So the suicide rates for African-Americans, um, the suicide rates for black, black populations from 2009 to 2018, um, we are seeing, we saw the increase go from, so if you, you can see kind of the smaller line go and even go up um, from 2009 to 2018. Now, one of the things that we can, that I can share here also is that even though the suicide rate for black Americans is, is lower than the, the, the average rate for, um, for suicide or the national rate, we are still seeing that kind of gradual increase over the year's time. I also found this uh, graph to be very interesting because this speaks specifically to black suicides in Texas. And so what I wanna show you here is that our suicide rates, and my numbers didn't come up on here, I do apologize for that, but our suicide rates have increased uh, in the African-Americans in Texas between, so th these are between 2011 and 2018. And I want you all to look at how, so if you look at the blue line with the squares, that is the state of Texas. So the rate of suicide for black Americans in Texas. And so I want you to look at how in 2016, there was a major hike in, in the suicide, in the number of suicide deaths. I wonder, you know, and I question and I wonder what was happening during that time or what was going on in 2016 where we saw such a large increase. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that I want you all to keep this in mind as we go into discussion about black, about black suicide in Texas and what we can do and what we should be paying attention to. Um, and so we are comparing this to the line on the bottom, which is the national, uh, the national rate of suicide per 100,000. And so over the years, African-Americans have been 
um, and especially Black African Americans in Texas, have our numbers have been lower than that of the national average until we get to about 2013, 2000, uh, about 2013, where it started to kind of even up. And then, of course, it, it went down again. We saw the spike in 2016, um, another or 2016, another drop in 2017, and now here we are going into 2019, 2020, where we're seeing the increase, the steady increase again. So. Another thing that I found interesting in finding in, in gathering this information for the presentation is the suicide rates um, for the black population in Texas by age and how it compares to the United States. So the suicide rates for the black population are the lighter gray boxes. Um, and one of the things that was noted here is that our suicide rate, the suicide rates for, for black Americans, for black people in Texas is as compared to the United States, it's lower. The, the larger difference though, is that, and something to pay attention to, is that we see the peak of our numbers of our suicide rates amongst our teenagers and our young adults. And then we see a decline. Whereas with, with other uh, groups, or when we look at the national numbers, then we'll see that the numbers peak around middle age. You know, and so it and then start to kind of decline again. And so to what that says is that our kids are younger as far as African Americans and, and are not our kids are younger, but as far as African Americans and, and black people in Texas particularly are concerned, our suicide rates are um, higher amongst our kids and our teenagers and they and so and therefore our they're they're more our, our high risk group. Why Keisha? Uh huh. This would be a really great time for me to interject a question that came in and it sure. was Nell would like to know, um, has there been an increase in suicide by teens as a as a result of bullying. There, there have I mean there's there's been a direct connection between suicide and bullying um, and there's also been a connection to. Uh, and there are studies and, and research that show that there are is a connection to cyberbullying and the increase of suicides and suicide attempts as a result of cyberbullying. So the more access to social media, the the inability to disconnect from the bullying because now it goes from just happening at school or at lunchtime or on the playground to at school, on the playground, via text message, on the internet, via social media, on Facebook, on websites. These kids have access to some everything. And so um, it, it is that, so yes, so there has been an increase due to bullying, but more particularly due to cyberbullying and the access to all of these different channels to harass someone. Is there another question? Okay. And so, okay, so we're going to, um, so let's go back to this next one. Uh oh, did it decide to quit? Okay, there we go. So there is the um, there is a survey that is done every two years. I'm sorry, jumped ahead of me. <laughs> um, there is a survey that's done every two years or so called the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey that asks questions that surveys um, a subset of schools across the country and asks questions about different risky behaviors uh, among teenagers. And they ask questions with regard to serious individuals if they've ever considered attempting suicide, if they made a suicide plan. Um, and then if they've uh, actually attempted or, or if they've made an attempt that required treatment. And so again, the Texas, the black population um, in Texas are our gray boxes. And I'm sorry, this chat is in my way. I'm trying to move it out the way. <laughs> I mean, the, the box of all the faces. Um, and so again, the black population in Texas is our gray boxes. Um, and then the overall US are the black boxes. And so what we what was what has been documented here is that while um, while many of our teenagers may have noted that they haven't seriously considered attempting suicide, and, and this survey asks like within the past year, have you seriously attempt, seriously considered? Um, however, what we did see is that the rate of suicide attempts for African American teens is higher. And we are noticing with the with the, with the research and stuff that's coming out here that's been coming out even before the COVID pandemic is that uh, African American teens are more likely to attempt, and the numbers are um, the numbers are are steadily rising. And so 
we again so while the pop while it's african americans and as blacks in texas our numbers may be lower as far as suicide deaths the rate of suicide attempts are still fairly high and I have a question. go ahead uh-huh all right um and you let me know what works best for you okay. let me know what works best for you for interjecting the questions okay sure um so the next question is uh what is the suicide rate among gay youth this was, I, I have that information, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, but in the list of resources that I'm going to offer um, in just a few minutes, there are some fact sheets specifically on the LGBTQ youth. Um, and there's also a little bit of information on LGBTQ Black youth as well. Um, and so, and one of the challenges that, we're, that we have is that there's a minimal amount of data and information on African Americans and suicide. So we're working with some kind of slim pickings, unfortunately, right now. Um, but I feel I have a feeling that that's going to be changing soon. So, um, so looking ahead, you know, and, and I, okay, what did that do? Okay, there we go. <laughs> so looking ahead, what I wanted to do is again provide you kind of with the base of information right I don't want to inundate you with a lot of data and a lot of stats and charts and whatnot I would like to I feel like the best way that we learn is by engaging in conversation and engaging in dialogue and discussion. Um, and so, but I did want to kind of set this the platform for where we are with regard to um, suicide in the black community I wanted to be able to answer some questions as well uh, and also. Um, you know, and also give you the opportunity to share ideas with each other and dialogue with one another. So looking ahead, um, we there's this concept that was kind of that was adopted called building the village. And we've all heard the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. And so where we are now is that now that we know about the increases in suicide and now that we know about the rate of suicide, we are at a place where we need to be working to build our village to support each other. Okay, there has to be more research um, on risk factors and protective factors in the black community. Um, even though some risk factors and protective factors may be the same across the board, it may look a little different culturally for, um, for black people and for other cultures as well. And so, so for instance, the little bit of research that, that has been um, developed shows that a major risk factor is the overexposure to traumatic experiences or the overexposure to racial, to racial trauma. And what's been happening in our communities for the past several years? It's been videos and pictures and all of this uh, media around racial injustice and deaths and murders of, of Black people. Um, you know, say, and so what they've also found uh, with that little bit of research is that a very good protective factor is being connected to someone and having a feeling of belonging and having a feeling of having a network, a network of support. And so um, understanding those risk and protective factors gives us kind of the leg up and a step ahead in order to prevent suicide. If we know what can create the problem and what may be able to prevent the problem, then we can develop programs that would be more effective in preventing suicide. There definitely needs to be more treatments that address trauma and cultivate that sense of connectedness and cultivate resiliency. Um, there have been, when in, in doing this research, I read an article that said that there are two studies that discuss um, effective treatment for African American for suicidal African Americans. And it, it was a little bit disheartening, but at least I found something. Because in 2004, when my brother died by suicide, I couldn't find a thing. Um, you know, it was, and data, Google, and all of these different articles, and Google Scholar, and all of these different things that I have access to now were nowhere to be found in 2004. We, I had a little bit of Roadrunner DSL action going on. The internet was slow. Um, Google was definitely not as robust as what it is. And a lot of information and data that I found on suicide back then had to be about um, 20, at least 20 years old, you know, and so we've come a long way with regard to um, what information is available, but more work needs to be done and there needs to be more attention put toward researching and developing programs to prevent suicide in, in the African American communities and in BIPOC communities in general. Um, you know, just more culturally specific work. 
Okay, and then one of the other things with building this village is the emergency task force for black youth suicide. How many of you have heard about that? So the Congressional Black Caucus developed the Emergency Task Force for Black Youth Suicide um, in 2000, I wanna say just early last year, just as the, they were, the Center for Disease Control was releasing the reports and the Journal of American Medicine um, were releasing these reports showing the increase in youth suicide. And so this is a start. Now, and this is a, the beginning to say, okay, larger community, United States, we need to pay attention to this problem that's, ha that's happening with our community and build the village around our children um, and around our young children who are dying by suicide. You know, and so one of the things that I think I, I failed to mention earlier is that another interesting thing about Afri the African American community in particular is that our children are our, our kids at younger ages. So um, 10 years between 10 and 14 and sometimes a little bit younger than that have a higher risk of attempting suicide than their uh, than their white classmates. And so there is definitely, and, and this is a time where in the suicide prevention world, we have not paid attention to younger ages. We, the focus has always been high school, some middle school work and college students, you know, as far as our young folks are concerned. And so this, this current information is telling us that we need to pay attention to our younger, our younger babies as well, that there's some help and some support that need to go on there. What you can do, Educate yourself, first of all, this is the beginning, you know, and this is very, you know, kind of um, kind of general information to start with. But the, the sooner you educate yourself about suicide, the sooner you can educate other folks about suicide, okay, and where they can go for help. Break down the stigma. Stigma is such a major issue overall, but it's such a big problem in the African American community. And I'll share, I'll share it with regard to suicide in particular um, and mental health. I'll share, I'll share a quick story with you. When, um, when my brother died by suicide, I re reached out for help. I struggled with grief. I struggled with major depression after his death. I didn't know what to make, how to make sense of it. Um, and I didn't know where to go for help. And so I've always been taught that when you have questions and I had questions about what his afterlife was like. Was he in heaven? Was he in hell? Was he still suffering? Was he going through all of these things? And I've always been told that once, if you have a question about faith or if you have problems in general, you go to church. And so I went to a church and I went in and I talked to, um, I talked to a lady at a church here in Houston and I told her, you know, that my brother had killed himself a few months ago and that I haven't been sleeping and I've been struggling with his death. And I just really wanted to talk with someone spiritually who could help me to understand and make sense of what happened and what is happening. And long story short, she walked off and she kind of gave a look like she didn't know what to do. She walked off. She went into the back office and talked to some people that were in the back room. There was some chatter about, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. You go talk to her, you go talk to her, all of those different things. And then she came back and she was like, well, you know, um, if you wait a few minutes, we can probably have one of the ministers to come and pray for you, but there's really not anything else we can do because we don't handle suicides. So I was like, okay. You know, and so then she was like, you know, she was like, and that's really all that we can do because, you know, with regard to your brother, he's already gone. He's already in hell because of what he did. So immediately that shut me down. Immediately that said something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with my family. Something was wrong with my brother. What is this thing? Am I... It is my faith now questioned because I'm grieving and because I feel suicidal and because I'm dealing with depression now. And, and it, that stigma is what prevented me from reaching out for help for almost a year and a half. And uh, likewise, it is also what pushed my mom to say he was just sick instead of saying he died by suicide for worry and concern about what people would say about her as a parent. For having lost her child you know and so when we have that type of stigma you literally push someone into a box by themselves and so educating ourselves is the best way to break down that stigma but also promoting mental health and wellness in black, black communities um, encouraging help-seeking behavior 
Uh, and even, you know, one of the great, one really great program that was happening a few years ago is when different mental health agencies were partnering with churches to train churches on how to talk with and communicate with someone that was having a mental health crisis and refer them to a mental health professional. Um, and so, and that kind of a connection is important, making those community connections and building the village, right? Um, and then- Lakeisha, uh -huh. I have just got to stop a minute sure. and tell you how sorry I am for your loss. And I am so sorry that you and your mom received that type of information. Oh, Stephanie, thank you for saying that. And, and you know, people, they just don't know. And so that's why I do what I do. And, and when we know better, we do better. And I appreciate you so much today. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for saying that, Stephanie. So I, you know, I, um, so, and then finally, we can create a safe place to talk about mental health and suicide without judgment. It's so important to create many more safe spaces and that the power of human connectedness, you guys, I love the fact that somebody did some research on how powerful it is just to sit down and talk and gossip with your friends. You know, it, it really does help to have a connection. And one of the protective factors for African-American women have one of the lower suicide rates than any other group. Um, and one of the protective factors that are, is a major contributor to that is that we have a sister circle. We have our network of friends that we go to, that we can say any and everything to, and they know exactly what to say, what to, say to us. You know, and having that connection, again, that feeling of belongingness and mattering is important. So these are the things that we can do to start to help prevent suicide in our community. And then I'll also, as you get ready to think about how and where to go and what to look for, I wanted to make sure that I provided you with some helpful resources. One of them for, for studies and fact sheets, you have the American Association of Suicidology, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention as well. Um, you, the Congressional Black Caucus, Caucus's Emergency Task Force that I mentioned, I included a link to their um, report that they issued on this emergency. Um, you know, and on this, on the issue with uh, Black youth suicide. And then I also wanted to make sure to include the National Organization for People of Color Against Suicide as well, who has a lot of data and a lot of information. And again, I don't want to, I didn't want to bore you all. So I kept the presentation short to have time for questions. And so with that, I will uh, turn it over and ask if there's any questions. All right, so I'm going to ask that we go to full galleries uh, view if we can for the questions. Thank you okay. so much. I, I, first of all, on behalf of all of us here, and if you want to turn your cameras on, uh, guys, you you may. Uh, we thank you, Waikisha, for your transparency today. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for showing up real and authentic. There thank are you. many questions today. Um, one of the and, and one of the comments that we got from Vicky was that um, one of the examples you shared was a fine example mm -hmm. of how um, places of worship uh, can come together and equip these tools together. Mm -hmm. So we thank you for that. Um, we would like you to discuss just general causes of suicide, and then someone else specifically asked uh, reasons why Black teens may commit suicide. Okay. And then, and also just a, a, just a disclaimer, I did forget to add this in the beginning. Um, the language and how we talk about suicide is also very important. So I want everyone to get comfortable with using, using terms like died by suicide as opposed to commit suicide. Okay. And so um, die by suicide, or you could even say to take their lives and things of that sort. Um, and also when we talk about su suicides versus suicide attempts, we try not to use terms like successful or incomplete. Mm. Um, and so you could just say a survived a suicide attempt or just a, a suicide attempt or die by suicide. And I share that information definitely not to throw you under the bus or anything, Kimberly, <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure that we um, use language that is helpful and that is supportive. And that so some of the risk factors related to why teens um, die by suicide, you know, the risk factors are actually fairly similar. Again, there's very little. Um, there's still very little research on re risk factors specifically directed toward our, our, our Black teens or just Black people in general. However, some, some that have been identified are issues with depression, poor family support, 
um, delinquent behavior, exposure to uh, online racially traumatic events. So again, the exposure to all the videos and um, and violence related to uh, just kind of the, the racial discord right now that's happening within our communities are a couple of uh, some of the things that have been mentioned. Um, and then uh, also, I think there's a question about to share a little bit about what was, and I'm sorry, I, there's a question about to share a little bit about what was most helpful for me in my recovery as well. I'm sorry if I jumped ahead of you, Kimberly. No, you didn't go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so the things that were helpful for me in my recovery, having that network of people that get it, there weren't very many, um, you, there weren't very many survivor suicide loss groups back in 2004 and, and not very many had a black face, but the people that were in that room that could help me to know and understand that I was not losing my mind, that what I was going through was normal, that this is grief, this is what grief looks like it is normal to ask the, and answer these questions. That was the most helpful thing for me, going to counseling and finding a good counselor um, that understood and maybe have some, has some background in grief and especially complicated grief with suicide was essential. Um, you know, and I, ha and I had a really great counselor that helped me get through that process. And when she retired, I was sick. I had to find a whole nother therapist. Um, but, I, uh, but finding that counselor is definitely also very helpful. As a survivor of suicide loss, one of the things that I had to do for myself was to find an answer to my why. One of the things that survivors of suicide loss struggle with a lot is trying to figure out the why. Why did this happen? What did I miss? What's the woulda, coulda, shouldas? And the reality is the only person that can really truly answer why is gone. So I had to find a why, an answer to my why that would help me sleep at night. And so as opposed to trying and searching for answers that you may or may not get, find the answer to your why that helps you sleep at night and that brings you some peace. Um, you know, and not necessarily the, and not the answer to the why in a sense that you're saying, okay, it's this person's fault or it's this system's or this situation's fault or anything like that, but just finding peace with, this is what happened to this person, this is why, now I can go to sleep. You know, and so that was the thing that was so helpful for me. And then also, to be honest with you, getting, um, ha coming to terms and having a piece about sharing my story with folks, which was very difficult for my parents at first that I was so openly speaking about it. Um, but we had to have a, we had to have a come to Jesus meeting. It was like, look, I'm going to say it. So this is, <laughs> you know, I, I won't beg you to, to stand up on the podium with me, but I intend to do so you know, and really just having those safe boundaries with my parents to help them understand how I'm recovering, but also to help them to understand what I needed from them with regard to support. So those are definitely the most helpful things and still most helpful to me. Any other questions? Um, Leanna had a question about, um, there's depression. I wanna make sure I don't mess up any of the words. Um, for uh, Black youth or children or students with disabilities um, who have attempts? In, for this particular presentation, I did not find any data for, um, for Black youth with disabilities. I, again, I, you know, to be, very, um, to be very candid, we are behind the eight ball on, on data for suicide in the Black community. You know? And so now when we get into very you know, subgroups, into the very smaller subgroups, like, like our Black teens with disabilities or even our LGBTQ Black teens, we may find an even smaller pool of data and research. So this is why it's important that we do invest our time and invest our money into learning about how we can best prevent uh, suicide amongst these different populations. Awesome. And we'd also love for you to share more about your zero suicide program. Absolutely. Um, I am so excited about the Zero Suicide Initiative and the Zero Suicide Framework. So for those of you who have never heard of Zero Suicide, the Zero Suicide Framework is a um, it's a, pro it's a program that's been designed to uh, implement systematic change with, within mental health and actual physical health uh, systems. And so it is designed to identify gaps, um, gaps where individuals may be more at risk for suicide because of those gaps. 
um, within the systems and implement policies and procedures to help to close the gaps and, and minimize the risk of a client dying by suicide. So um, in Texas, it, you know, which I'm really, which I'm also super excited about in Texas, there are many of our, um, our mental health agencies like the Harris Center who are implementing zero suicide within the organization. And what that means is that we have made a commitment to look at all of our policies and procedures, to look at how we train our staff, to look at how we support our staff, um, look at our transition policies and identify where there may be gaps in which we, in which a person or a client that we're serving is at risk for suicide and then figure out ways to close those gaps. Um, and so uh, like the Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD, there are several other organizations like Integral Care who are also working um, to implement zero suicide across the state. And so my, and initially I've been with the Harris Center for about a year and a half now. And even I think on day one, I told them, I was like, oh yeah, we're gonna have to figure out how, how y'all can let me loose in the medical center. And I need to, I need zero suicide to be implemented in every medical facility and every mental health facility across the state of Texas. But let me start in Houston in my bubble um, in the medical center first. And if I can get it in there, then I know we can knock it out and get it everywhere. Um, you know, and the important, the great part about zero suicide, uh, the zero suicide framework is that it is really focused on systematic change from leadership all the way down to the front desk, you know, and so it is looking at different ways and different areas in the way we do things and the way we learn about things in order to provide more effective care to our clients and to prevent suicide within those systems. Thank you so much. So we are making really great time and this is rich. So as we said in the beginning, we wanted to make time for you to be able to ask your questions and to give feedback. I have quite a few hosts on the screen today. So if you would just raise your hand, um, we are ready to allow you to ask your questions or to make comments at this time. Just, or just simply unmute yourself. Um, Elliot, I see you. Unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Welcome. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> not necessarily a question, uh, but more so to comment <clears throat> on your piece with you know, Black youth and suicide attempts. And, and I apologize, unsuccessful uh, death by suicide. Is that, am I using the correct language there? Death by suicide. Death by suicide, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really does mean a lot to me because I, <clears throat> excuse me, because I am a, when I say survivor of two suicide attempts. Yes, that's right. Uh, yes, yeah, so being within that space, I'm very fortunate, you know, I, it wasn't successful. And I thought I had dedication and I did, but then I'm very, again, thankful to be here and make this comment because it's the truth. Like just growing up, we didn't have anybody that talked about suicide, no way, shape or form. Not uh, definitely not in the house, definitely yeah. not at school. Uh, I, my first attempt was in college, second attempt was in college, and then you know, I, you know, I made that eventual decision, you know, to understand why I was having those attempts and where, you know, those struggles were coming from, and it wasn't an instantaneous thing, but mm -hmm. like to what you said that point on discovering that answer, it was, it was key. Uh, and one thing that I also like to share just from my experience, when people ask me about my attempts, it's been, how can I, you know, stop or what can I do if a friend or a loved one is also wants to do this, you know, what can I say? What can I do? And I just tell them, it's not your fault. Like you, mm -hmm. we can't know. Like that's one of the things that killed me inside afterward and really made my struggle uh, coming even to this point was that I was so ashamed of the hurt and the pain and the confusion that I put my loved ones through because no matter what, I mean, I would have been gone and there's no way that I would have been able to explain to them. And so I know people who have, have lost loved ones to attempts you know, at suicide. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I hope that people can just understand it's not their fault. As a person who made those attempts, it's not my family's fault. It's not my friend's fault. Uh, they would never know. So those who have lost loved ones, yeah. I know it's a struggle to hear, but it's not, 
their faults. But you know, Elliot, that is, I think for survivors of suicide loss, that's one of the things that we need to hear is that it is not our fault because we do take on all the responsibility for our loved one's death. And, um, you know, I'll also say to you though, um, to, you know, with your guilt about hurting your family, that was never, your intent was never to hurt your family, I'm assuming. And therefore <laughs> your guilt is misplaced, um, you know, in that sense. And the fact that you are still here and you are in recovery and you are trying to take care of yourself says that you care about yourself and that you care about your family. Um, you know, and so I, when you think about the state of mind of someone who um, is feeling suicidal, there is a level of dis despair and a level of just so much hurt that nothing else makes sense but to try to take my life, right? And so mm -hmm. and in, the, in that state of mind, that's when support and help comes in. You know, and so I, I tell people all the time, if you have a friend who's feeling suicidal, one of the things you can do, even if your friend is like, no, I'm fine, I'm good. No, get all up in their business, be nosy. Don't let them leave, you know, or go to their house, you know, and things like that. Make them stay at your house, take their keys, you know, and things, you know, but it, it is a matter of really, again, creating the safe space to talk about, to really talk about struggle, to really talk about pain and to really talk about health and healing and recovery. You know, I think we, we work so hard to come off as perfect that we create this, this environment for ourselves where we can't be vulnerable. And that makes, us, that makes us vulnerable to suicide. You know, that makes us vulnerable to the pressures and the stress that create suicidal thought. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot, again. We have a question uh, from Facebook. I'm going to give you both questions at the same time because we want all of this good stuff that you are offering. The first okay. question is, um, is the low suicide rate among African-American women relatable to the high level of our women? That was the question that came uh -huh. in. And then the other question was, um, how are we helping in our elementary schools uh, with children who have made attempts and are the schools really equipped to help the students, especially the black students? Because I can say I don't notice the crisis team coming in until after something has, something has happened and less proactive responses. Thank you. So, okay, so the first question, um, is the low rate of suicide among African-American women relatable to the high level of our women? The high level of resilience of African-American women. So I'm very careful not to, not to promote or endorse the strong black woman stereotype. And the reason why is because, yes, we are strong and resilient women, but we should not be expected to be strong and resilient all the time. And so, because that is, any strong person gets exhausted. Like even Superman had his little hideaway when he got sick of people, you know? And so we have to keep that in mind. However, um, the level of resilience and some of the things that creates that level of resilience for African-American women are those resilience factors we need to learn more about. The access to support, the fact that we go to the doctors more often and we get checkups. Um, the fact that we are, uh, that we have that, that social network and that social connectedness and our connection to our, our church, um, which also creates the connectedness and the belongingness that's needed. And so it's not necessarily um, that we are just resilient as people, but there are some things that we do within our culture and as individuals that, may, that provide more protective factors against suicide. Um, and then the next question is, what are we doing for our elementary age kids? And so while I'm not in the school system, a few things that I do know is that many schools have been, school districts and our educational development centers and things like that have been working with mental health organizations. I know Hogg Foundation uh, has done some funding um, for, for work within the schools where they're really trying to figure out how to build a network of support for our kids. Um, in Houston, we have, our kids have access to mental health professionals. There are counselors available to them. There are resources available to them. Um, it has been my experience in some districts where, uh, like, like you just mentioned, where the crisis team doesn't come until after the fact. Uh, and so to that, I will say that there, there does need to be a little bit more culture change, but I think the schools are doing the best that they can. They do need help and support. 
you know, our, our schools in general are, you know, our classes are large. There's a lot of kids and the teachers and counselors can't do it all by themselves. So there's going to be need to be a community, a village that's supporting them. The school can only do so much. Thank you. So to be true to our time, um, looks like we have time for one more question. Um, it just came in. What role can the church play in raising awareness about hard topics like suicide and mental health? So call me. Um, <laughs> first of all, I, you know, so call me. But the other part is take trainings. Um, again, create the environment during National Suicide Prevention Month or even like the National Day of Prayer in May. Those are great opportunities to really promote suicide awareness and suicide prevention and create the safe space to talk about suicide. Um, there is also a training called Soul Shop. Um, S-O-U-L shop. I have braces, so my list is really bad right now. Um, but it, there's a training called Soul Shop that's specifically designed to train faith communities in suicide prevention. And it ties it to the Bible and it ties it to other uh, religious texts. And so one of, the, one of my things of research that I did because I was so angry after leaving that church, I started doing research about what the Bible says about suicide. There are seven accounts of suicide in the Bible none of which says that anybody goes to hell and die, it, it, you know, goes to hell and burns fail, you know, just FYI. And the soul and what soul shop does is that it shares that information, what it's, what the Bible says about suicide, what the Bible says about help seeking behavior um, and what other religions will say about suicide and help seeking behavior and how faith communities can help their, their congregation and their par parishioners. Um, so there's definitely, I would say, take training, build a crisis team and train a crisis team, you know, uh, call me, like I said, <laughs> um, you know, and, and uh, again, just from my personal experiences, I'm happy. I love going to the faith community just to share that information because that same church who turned me away now has a counseling center and offers free counseling services to their congregation. So I was so proud to hear that. And they still don't know about the impact that they had on me. Um, but I'm just happy to see that they've made some pro progress and, so, and have evolved into a different place. I need other faith communities to get to where they are. That is awesome. Again, I want to make sure I take this opportunity to thank you, Ms. Waikisha McKinney, for again, sharing yourself so real and authentic with us. If you will put your contact information since you're saying call. I will. <laughs> you need someone to talk to, um, thank you for that. And I also want to especially thank AISD again uh, for sponsoring uh, today's forum and for providing our interpreters. And at this time, I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Lenora Vargas to open up her mic and simply just have a few words. Thank you again for bringing AISD into this very courageous and important conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holiday, and thank you, Ms. McKinney, for this opportunity. Definitely walking okay. away feeling gifted and blessed by your wisdom um, to be able to support our students and families in our district. But I also wanted to share with the families, I know there was a question about services you know, around AISD and what is available for support. Um, I want all our families and everyone who's listening to know that we do have counselors on our campuses and all our campuses do have a crisis team that can be responsive. And we also have some safeguards in our technology. Um, our any students who are using an issue device has um, a system that if a student is thinking about suicide or is making an outcry, we're able to monitor that as well. And, and that is all posted on our website if people need additional information. But we do have um, a crisis team and we do offer free counseling to all our families families um, via our, our VA clinic and we're providing that telehealth right now. So happy to share all that information. But any AISD family that um, is needing some support, please reach out to your school counselor or you can also reach out to our office, the Parent Engagement Support Office, and our number is 512-414-0726. Um, but as always, I know there's also the Christ Helpline that's available through Integral Care as well. Thank you all. Thank you so very much. Um, you know, if this was church, I would ask you, Ms. Waikisha, if you had any last words and benediction before we roll it over <laughs> to this raffle we're about to go to. Pass around this collection plate. And then, <laughs> 
no, I, my last words is that, uh, again, thank you all so much for being open to learning. And thank you so much for um, being here and hearing me. And, you know, again, I am happy to answer any questions or point you in the right direction. Um, you know, as to, so if I don't know it, I can definitely find somebody that has an answer to it. Um, and I'm I, again, just thank you so much. And let's go and let's save these kids and get our life and get these lives uh, into happy, healthier places. Thank you. Awesome. And you know what, while we're on this screen, I would like to publicly invite you and I do hope that we see you at our virtual conference in February. I if will be actually. Woo. Yes, I will be at the virtual conference. Yes. Awesome. Um, just so you know, so we can get some more information and deep dive um, into this very important topic. Um, suicide is affecting our people and we are seeing it a lot more. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. So we have people who have joined us via Facebook and we have so many people here on the Zoom meeting today. I'm so honored to have been your moderator today. Uh, we want to be true to your time. And so what we're going to do right now is we have a couple of items from our new conference shop. Make sure y'all get y'all swag. Okay, we have t shirts, mugs, hoodies, string bags, and more. Um, you can order your stuff if you don't win at ctaafsc.com. You can get yours. So when we're on the virtual screen um, in February, you can come with your water bottle and all your stuff. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to spin the wheel. Look at that. Isn't that so beautiful? Technology. All right. So, and we thank Lady Jane and everyone who is in the background to make sure that this technology runs well. It looks like we have a winner. <laughs> is she present with us today? Because in order to win, you must be present. So I'm going to ask one of my hosts to check and see if she is actually on the screen with us. If not, we're going to go again. And we're spinning again. Here we go. We have a winner and we have some swag for you. Um, I believe we're going to have two winners, Lady Jane. If you could talk to me, here we go. I think we're spinning again. Yep, yep, yep. And our second winner today is... All right, this is good. It looks like we have one final question I want to make sure we get to. Um, oh, we're spinning again. I guess we got a lot of stuff to give away. Woo, 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 woo! Emmett Hayes! <laughs> so awesome. All right, so congratulations to all of our winners today. Again, thank you to AISD for sponsoring and for live streaming on AISD TV. We thank all of you who have joined us via Facebook and, you know, and those of you who are here and have been intentional to meet with us today on the screen. I want to remind you that the 2021 Central Texas African American Family Support Conference is going to be virtual this year. The dates are February the 3rd through the 5th, 2021. And we also have a youth summit, which we call Yes to Best. It is also going to be virtual and it is going to be on February the 6th, 2021. And you know what? I bet we'll be deep diving into this very conversation again. So um, I also want to encourage you to visit the conference website. Uh, again, ctaafsc.com to nominate someone for an award. 
um, to apply to be an exhibitor or to register to attend the conference. I also would like to encourage you to join our Facebook page where you can get real time information every day in between the forums. Uh, we meet here uh, on the third Wednesday of every month, same time, same place. We'll probably continue these and build them as the conference continues. Again, I thank you for being here. My name is Kimberly Holiday, known to the world as Lady Joy. It has been my absolute pleasure to serve. Again, Waikisha, thank you for being here.